Oh, hello, great readers. I'm Ba Chen. I'm Nimikong. I'm Van Chan. In this class, I'll read to all of you. Club. 30 to sec 3 of Jane Eyre and Autobiography. S. Oh. Jane Eyre and Autobiography. Shelley Brunt. Club. 32 sec 3. I will not pause either to accuse or open. I know poetry is not dead. Nor Jean is lost. Nor has Mammon gained power over either. To bind or slay. They will both assert their existence. Their presence. Their liberty and strength again one day. Powerful angels. Safe in heaven. They smile when sordid souls triumph. And feeble ones weep over their destruction. Poetry destroyed. Genius banished. Both. Mediocrity. The. Do not let envy prompt you to the thought. No. They are not only life, but reign and redeem. And without their divine influence spread everywhere, you would be in health hell of your own meanness. While I was eagerly glancing at the bright pages of Marmion from Marmion, it was. Strip. John stooped to examine my drawing. His tall figure sprang erect again with a start. He said nothing. I looked up at him. He shunned my eye. I knew his thoughts well. And could read his heart plainly. At the moment I felt Comor and Kula than he. I had then temporarily the advantage of him. And I conceived an inclination to do him some good. If I could, with all his firmness and self-control, thought I, he tasks himself too far, locks every feeling and ping within expresses, confesses, imparts nothing. I am sure it would benefit him to talk a little about this sweet Ross Amund, whom he thinks he ought not to marry. I said first. Take a chair. Whistle. Rivers. But he answered. As he always did. That he could not stay. Very well, I responded. Mentally. Stand if you like. But you shall not go just yet. I am determined. Solitude is at least as bad for you as it is for me. I'll try if I cannot discover the secret spring of your confidence. Is this portrait like? I asked bluntly. Like? Like whom? You did. Mister. He almost started at my sudden and strange abruptness. He looked at me astonished. Well, that is nothing yet, I muttered within. I don't mean to be baffled by a little stiffness on your part. I'm prepared to go to considerable lengths. I continued. You observed it closely and distinctly. Placed it in his hand. A well-executed picture, he said. Very soft. Clear colouring. Yes. Yes. I know all that. But what of the resemblance? Mastering some hesitation. He answered. Miss Oliver. Of course. And now. So. To reward you for their curate guess. I will promise. Must paint you a careful and faithful duplicate of this very picture. 
provided you admit that the gift would be acceptable to you. He continued to gaze at the picture. The longer he looked, the firmer he held it, the more he seemed to covet it. It is like he murmured, the eyes were managed, the colour, bite, expression, are perfect. Would it comfort? Or would it wind you to have a similar painting? Tell me that, when you are at Madagascar, or at the Cape or in India, would it be a consolation to have that memento in your position? He now furtively raised his eyes. He glanced at me. A salute. Disturbed. He again surveyed the picture. That I should like to have it is certain. Since I had obtained that Ross Amund really preferred him and that her father was not likely to oppose the match. Illis exalted in my views than street. Shunt had been strongly disposed in my own heart to advocate their union. It seemed to me that should he become the possessor of Mr. Oliver's large fortune, she knew out to wither and his strength to waste under a tropical sun. With this persuasion I now answered, as far as I can see. By this time he had sat down. He had laid the picture on the table before him, and with his brow supported on both hands, hung fondly over it. I discerned he was now neither angry nor shocked at my audacity. Cliché and unhoped for relief. The expense of the sternest seeming stalk is human after all. Often to confer on them the first of obligations. She likes you. I am sure, said I. As I stood behind his chair. And her father respects you. Moreover. She is a sweet jeweler, rather thoughtless. You would have sufficient thought for both yourself and her. Does she like me? He asked. Certainly. Better than she likes anyone else. She talks of you continually. It is very pleasant to hear this, he said very. And laid it upon the table to measure the time. But where is the use of going on? I asked. When you are probably preparing some iron bow of contradiction. Don't imagine such hard things. Fancy me yielding and mouthing. As I am doing. With the seeds of good intentions. Us self denying plans. And now it is deluged with an extra house fluid of thin germ swamp delicious poison concurring them. My bride Ross am in the lover's feet. Your scuffle hand has copied so was smiling at me with these coral lips. She is my knee and her spies present life and passing words suffice to me. Osh. I humored him. Watch Dickton. He breathed fast and low. I stood silent. Amidst this hush the court at sped. He replaced the watch. Laid the picture down. Was and stood on the hearth. Now said he, that little space was given to delirium and delusion. I rested my temples on the breast of temptation and put my neck voluntarily under her yoke of flowers. I tasted her cup. The pillow was burning. There is an asp in the garland. The wine has a bitter taste. Her promises are hollow, their offers false. I gazed at him in wonder. To be continued.